Well, hi there. So in this video, we're going to do the second topic of market failures, um, which is called externalities. And so in the previous video, I gave you the list of different market failures, and we explored tragedy of the commons and the free rider problem. Um, and in this one, we're going to talk about externalities. So um, there, are, there are two types of externalities that we'll get into here. But before we define them, we got to get kind of into the, the big picture a little bit. So the basics are the idea that, you know, we've talked about before supply and demand being kind of the marginal cost of production and the marginal benefit of consumption. But an important note here is that when we've been talking about it before, it's just to the supplier in terms of the cost, or it's the benefit to the consumer. So when we talk about a demand curve, it's like how many, how much utils did you get, you know, and, and so that's, you know, pretty, pretty just isolating in terms of you, the producer. For most transactions, like, you know, if I ever get a haircut again, we'll see, uh, society is only tangentially affected. There's not really someone else who's party to the transaction. But in certain transactions, society incurs an additional cost or an external cost or an external benefit from the transaction. So we would actually say that in certain ones, you've got this kind of private benefit plus an external benefit, and that gives you a social benefit, right? So we can say here the marginal external benefit, and you have this marginal social benefit. And so if you took the, you know, the marginal private benefit, uh oh, my pen's dying on me. I got to switch. I'm going to use red. So hopefully that, hopefully this pen even works. Um, if you added, right, the marginal private benefit and the marginal external benefit, you get the social benefit, or it's kind of like saying the total benefit. Another way to think about it is you have the marginal private cost, right, the MPC, the marginal private cost. Um, and you add the marginal external cost and you get a marginal social cost. So that's kind of adding those things together. So these would be transactions where there's some sort of extra cost outside. A negative externality is one where you have an external cost. So here's a list of them, right? You know, you have polluting industry, polluting industry. Um, you have drugs, you have guns. Oops, be nice if I could spell. You have alcohol, um, something I'm calling NIMBYs, um, which is not in my backyard buildings, right? So these are any buildings where you're like, uh, I don't want that in my backyard. That, that smells bad. Mm, that messes up my view, right? So if, if you think about, you know, an apartment building that's constructed and it messes up someone's view, there's an external cost to that aside from, you know, the, the internal cost of, of someone building the apartment building. The person who lives next door has shadows constantly in their backyard. That's a great example of a negative externality. Uh, any kind of carbon emitting activity, so driving, flying, you know, carbon activities, those are, are very huge negative externalities. They're actually so big um, that a lot of economists are just like, holy cow, carbon, wow, what a huge external cost. Um, the positive externalities are ones where you have external benefits, right? So these would be things like, you know, taking a vaccine. And if, if, you're, if you're struggling with understanding that, it would be the herd immunity, right? If I get a vaccine, it prevents, generally speaking, me from getting sick. But in addition, it prevents someone else potentially from getting sick. And we can't even quantify necessarily sometimes who that other person is, but we can try to estimate the value to society of it. Um, this is one that's quite timely, mask wearing in a pandemic. Mask wearing. Because if I wear the mask, I'm less likely to get sick but I'm also less likely to spread a disease to the rest of society. So there's external benefits. Rainwater runoff management, that's a lot of words, but it's the idea of if you can manage uh, rainwater runoff, then it not only helps your property because you're able to avoid erosion, but it also helps manage basically the people around you. Um, attractive landscaping is another example of that. It helps your property value, but it helps other people's as well. So you can think about like, yes in my backyard style things um, where things that are good educational services so schools or schooling is one where you, it accrues personal benefits to you right private benefit but there's external benefit as well we find that people who engage in more schooling end up having all sorts of other beneficial things they, they do um, less risky behaviors they, they're less costly to the healthcare system yada 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 uh, pest control efforts like if i prevent the mosquitoes from breeding in my yard. Um, it also benefits you because you're less likely. Uh, beekeeping is another good example of them. 
um, because you get benefits, but also the broader society does. So anything where there's kind of an external benefit would be one of those kind of things. Now, we're going to do two graphs, and I'm going to do both of them in this spot here, um, but we're going to do one at a time. And we're going to show what those externalities look like. So the first thing we're going to do is just draw a supply and demand graph. So we've got demand and supply, and we're going to do um, alcohol first. So alcohol is a classic example of a negative externality where actually lots of research has been done to quantify exactly how much the extra cost is um, per alcohol. Um, so like on a, on a, like a, per, um, a per alcoholic unit basis, you can quantify, well, how many extra you know, trips to the emergency room we're going to have? How many more drunk driving arrests are we going to have? How many more people are going to have major problems with alcoholism? And what's the cost of those? And then we just divide it by the total number, basically, of, of consumed alcohol units. And we can find, like, what's the external cost every time someone buys an alcoholic drink. Now, what we do is we say this, the S-curve is the marginal private cost, right? And the demand curve is the marginal private benefit. Now, in this world, there isn't a, a external benefit to alcohol consumption. So we're just going to have an MPB. And that also is the MSB. It's the same as the social benefit because the social benefit and the private benefit are the same thing. There's no extra. But with this curve, we're going to say there's an extra cost. And it's the vertical distance, kind of the vertical distance between these two lines. And if we add that marginal external cost, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see. If we add that marginal external cost, we get something called the marginal social cost. And so this is kind of the true cost of the, of supplying alcohol, right? Now, what we know is that the market is going to generate QM at PM, but there's an optimal, right? Taking into account, there's an optimal quantity that is less at Q opt and an optimal price that is higher at P opt. And so this would take into account the fact that there's an external cost associated with alcohol consumption. Um, in just a moment, I'll kind of explain the simple way to solve this problem. How could we go from QM to QOpt and go from PM to POpt? How could we get to that quantity and prevent this externality? Well, it's a fairly straightforward process. Now, before we do that, though, we're going to look at the positive externality graph. And it's going to look quite similar, Q. P, we'll start with supply and demand. Now, with this one, uh, let's say vaccines. That's timely, right? Vaccines. So we know that the market is going to generate a certain quantity and price of vaccines. Um, and what we'd find is that you have this marginal private benefit to getting a vaccine, that you have a certain amount of benefit to getting it. Um, and there is some sort of marginal private cost of providing it. There isn't really an extra cost to society when we talk about having vaccines. If there is, they're quite minimal. And so we can kind of just say that that one doesn't matter. So we'd say that the marginal social cost is equal to the marginal private cost. These are the same thing. Just like over here, the social benefit and the private benefit are the same thing. But with vaccines, we find that the private benefit doesn't encapsulate the entire benefits. We know that there's extra benefits to other people when we get vaccines. And so we find that there's a second demand curve. And this is like society's demand for it. And we call that the marginal social benefit, right? And so the distance between the two, the vertical distance, is the marginal extra benefit. And so if we just shift that, that first demand curve up, by the amount of kind of the external benefit, we get the social benefit. And so what we find is that societally, there's an optimal quantity, right? There's an optimal quantity and there's an optimal price. There's an optimal price, okay? And that optimal price would be the one that would induce basically kind of this, this amount, right? This amount to be produced. Um, and this optimal quantity is the quantity that would be societally appropriate. Now, because we aren't at these, we can say there's deadweight loss, right? There is deadweight loss because we're not at the optimal. And the simplest way to find the deadweight loss is to know that there's an arrowhead that points toward the optimal. So it's an arrowhead, right? Think about like a, you know, like a, literally the head of an arrow and it's pointing toward an optimal point, 
right? And so if we look on this one, on the one over here, we know the optimal points here. So there's an arrowhead right here that points to it. And that's the dead weight loss from allowing this amount of alcohol to be consumed. So we should be at Qopt, and the arrowhead is kind of pointing us there. But this one, the arrowhead is pointing towards the optimal, and it starts at the quantity that the market is producing. And that's true for both of them, right? If you look at them, they start at the quantity the market's producing and they point towards the optimal. If you quantify that, that's the value to society of, of this inefficiency. It's the problem, right? Now we can fix these things. Actually, it's fairly straightforward to do it. Um, and that's so we've identified the deadweight loss, but we can fix that. And the easiest way is to use what's called a Piguvian tax or subsidy. And it was named after the economist named Pigou. And Pigou basically said, you just tax the negative ones. And so you just create a tax per unit in the amount of the marginal external cost. So you would say, uh, per, let me move this up so you can see just a little bit. Zoom, zoom, too much zooming. Uh, you just use a, a per unit tax equal to the marginal external cost. That's all you have to do. And what that will do is it will shift this SMPC. It'll shift it vertically up by the amount up to match the MSC. And then society is, is totally, you know, hunky dory because then you actually are at P opt. Q opt. So that's all you got to do for those. Now for subsidies, it's a little bit more complicated. You just say per unit subsidy equal to the marginal external benefit. And so you just say, we're going to, every time you consume one, we're going to give you an extra, you know, whatever this vertical distance is. If it's $2 worth of benefit, we just give you $2 every time you do it. And what that will do is it will shift people's demand curves up by two because you get an extra two dollars and so then the p opt that's the amount the producers earn and then the amount that people actually pay is on their original demand curve right so this is what the consumer pays is down here and the vertical distance between the two is the the amount of the per unit subsidy um, so the consumer pays on the original demand curve and the government just comes in and says here's two dollars every time you do this and so then it shifts this curve up and we get to Q opt and we clear the deadweight loss. There is one last way that you can solve an externality, but it's quite a limited, actually, um, a limited scenario. And it's one where if you have a really small externality where it's just a few people being affected, you could define property rights and allow people to negotiate their way out of it. Um, and, and, and the short uh, explanation of it is like, if I raise chickens in my yard and it hurts your property values, but I have you know, no legal right to raise chickens, you could either A, call the cops and you know, shut the whole thing down, or you could come to me and say, Daniel, uh, I know you love raising chickens. It hurt my property value by $5,000 for you to raise chickens. If you love chickens more than $5,000, you just pay me and I'll not call the cops. And so if I love chickens to the tune of like $7,000, I'll just write a check and we're done, right? So you just define property rights, you define who's allowed to call the cops, and then you say, allow them to negotiate and they can solve the externality. It only works with if there's very few people involved. So things like vaccines and alcohol, the Coase theorem doesn't work, um, but, but it is a, it's a market solution to the problem of externalities. Okay, so hopefully this helps you. We'll do some more practice with externalities in just a minute. See you next time.